I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, Growing Concerns for July the 18th. Um, going to, uh, I guess, uh, start with a crops update like we normally do. And uh, this, this time I've got a little bit of a longer update. I've kind of tried to go through most of the crops in the past week here and talk, get a little bit of information as to what's going on in most of them so we can get a little bit of update on most of the stuff that's going on out there. And then to end it off, I'm going to look at uh, talking about, a little bit about pre-harvest and uh, basically for this uh, webinar, I'm going to concentrate on the, on the winter crops, uh, getting, starting to get some calls on the winter wheat and the fall rye, and we're about a, a week away in, uh, in the southwest here for a lot of producers starting to look at uh, pre-harvest. So we're uh, going to uh, talk a little bit about pre-harvesting some of the winter crops. I guess uh, just like normal, uh, Linda is on holidays this week, so Karma Lewandowski from Minidosa is uh, helping me out. And so if there's questions uh, throughout the webinar, if you could uh, just type them in, and Linda with uh, Karma will uh, will take them and we'll try to answer them as we're going. And uh, I guess uh, with that, we'll get started. So I guess, uh, first of all, uh, um, this time of year when you're looking in the winter wheat crops uh, and actually even some of the early, early seeded cereal crops, we're definitely starting to see some of the fusarium uh, head blight issues showing up in many fields. Um, this was found in winter wheat this past week and uh, if you look close enough, uh, you could see the pinkish uh, spores forming on the head. So uh, uh, a head that got infected fairly severely with uh, fusarium. And uh, just, I guess, uh, uh, an update as to the fusarium, even though we did see a lot of spraying happening in this part of the province, uh, uh, we are still seeing fusarium showing up. And I can imagine in the next week or so, it'll be showing up fairly regular in a lot of the, uh, of the uh, spring seed cereal crops. And I guess it's just a reminder to us that uh, the fungicides do help, but uh, you know, there's more than just the, the fungicide, it's the timing of application and, and a lot of the other factors, so the severity of the, of the disease at the time. And uh, just, uh, you know, there's so many factors that come into the, trying to control a disease and, uh, you know, just by applying a fungicide doesn't mean we're going to get control. So, so if you're adding your winter wheat fields, uh, Fusarium is showing up uh, and uh, is... Uh, I guess the thing with that, uh, one more comment on it, is depending on when the infection occurred, um, hopefully the infection occurred and it's severe enough that uh, it eliminates the head or basically uh, whatever part of the head it infected, uh, the kernels will, won't develop or they'll be shriveled up kernels and then the opportunity to move those through the combine and, and remove them from the samples can be a lot easier. If the infection happens, uh, you know, later on, uh, sometimes we see those kernels still develop and produce a, produce a normal sized kernel. And then there are those white chalky kernels that land up in your sample and, and then become a downgrading issue. So, uh, you know, I guess uh, timing wise, so is also going to be, um, I guess, when the infection happened, is going to depend on how severe it's going to be in the sample. Mentioned this a bit last week, but I was seeing it again this week and uh, seeing it in a lot of the crops that uh, were just nicely, uh, I guess, heading this past week. So kind of just about in the perfect stage for an ap application of fungicide for fusarium control. Uh, this was a crop of 5603 and uh, seeing, uh, seeing rust in it, uh, again, uh, kind of surprising to see the amount of uh, rust that, that I have been seeing so far this year in some of the varieties. Uh, last week the picture was a picture of, uh, of blend wheat and we found it in blend wheat and then now up in this, uh, this was in two separate fields, we found this one um, in the uh, western side of the province here. So uh, again, uh, rust is, uh, is there. Um, and, and I guess just a caution to those producers that uh, have some later crop out there that um, last year we ran into a problem with uh, some of the green feed crops, especially oats. Uh, and uh, when guys that were, you know, 
not looking at having to, to spray any fungicide on some of those green pea crops and then later on finding out that a lot of those crops were affected fairly severely with, uh, with rust and actually losing the majority of the yield of the crops. So um, just because it's a later crop, uh, you should still be out there checking to see what's going on and uh, especially if it's a wheat crop, um, wheat prices have been going up uh, quite a bit over the last uh, week or so here and uh, an application of a fungicide like uh, tilt or bumper or quilt, any of those ones um, uh, that would, uh, would easily control the rust. So uh, an easy fungicide application here would, uh, would, would slow this down. Got a call uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, uh, from a producer and uh, he was noticing a lot of uh, whitish type heads in his field. And, um, you know, we always go back to the standard of, uh, you know, wheat stem maggot or something like that. But uh, went out to take a look at the field and was seeing uh, uh, a large uh, a large amount of these, uh, these plants showing up. And they were kind of showing up in clusters almost. So we uh, started doing a little bit more looking around and um, pulled out some of the plants and uh, seeing that there was very, very poor root development on these plants. And uh, right now, um, I'm thinking it's root rot. I've sent some samples away to, uh, to determine it. But uh, it, it looks like there's uh, poor root development. And then when you throw a combination of uh, uh, fairly wet soils and then getting dry here this past you know, week and a half here, we're going to be getting 30 to 33 degree temperatures. And that top layer drying out, you get a combination of uh, of moisture or dry drought stress that with uh, with the disease and it just started to show up in a lot of fields. After the, that producer called, I actually got two or three more calls regarding the same thing from different areas, and uh, so uh, be interesting to see what the results come back as. But uh, right now, um, I would say it looks like a, a root rotter or just very poor root development in in those plants. And uh, it was a fairly wide range of area where I was getting the calls from. So uh, I guess uh, there's uh, just, uh, you know, you look at the wheat crop, you look at those heads that uh, were uh, these whitish heads here. Uh, they were barely filling, and any, a lot of them were aborting, or, or there was no, 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 no kernel development at all. So, um, you know, just something that uh, else that uh, I guess we're seeing out there right now that uh, uh, they're just caused by the uh, by the severe uh, heat we've had over the last couple of weeks. We got some rain, uh, you know, the last couple of days here over the weekend, so that might help out on some of the ones that weren't affected too bad. But uh, there's definitely going to be uh, an effect on yield on some of these. I mentioned the wheat stem maggot, and that was kind of my first thought when the producer was on the phone with me. So. I figured I'd throw in a slide of wheat stem maggot just to uh, to show what it uh, what it does look like. You got the whitish head, and then when you pull on that stem, it, it would separate from uh, from the plant and pull out of this first out of up from out of the flag leaf or out of the, the last joint there when it's coming through the plant. And uh, when you look at that uh, stem, you can see a lot of feeding on the stem. And what happens is the the wheat stem maggot will lay, uh, lay its eggs inside the, inside the stem and what happens is those larvae or eggs hatch and the larvae feed on the, on the inside and so that's why that stem is uh, ripens prematurely or dies off basically and then when you go to pull it, it pulls up very easy. In contrast, if you were to pull that one, um, that one and, uh, and the whole plant would come out, you would get stuff, some symptoms are, are um, plants similar to this one, if you pull them in, the whole plant comes out, and that's what was happening here. Uh, those are usually common symptoms of root rot, so that's why I was thinking we were getting some root rot issues here. But then when we pull the plants and see the poor root development too, I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's a combination of root rot and and drought stress. This past week here, or a week and a half, I've been getting several calls uh, regarding uh, yellowing in flax. And uh, we've uh, been trying to figure out what's been going on in some of these fields. Um, 
Um, the common, I guess, uh, or the, the quick answer would be Aster's yellow, but uh, we were seeing num our levels so high that we were starting to get concerned that maybe we were seeing something else. On some of the fields, we were looking at chemical residue, and some of the results came back showing uh, possibility of chemical residue. Um, we we're seeing some, actually, some uh, root rot in, in, in the flax as well. But the majority of the problem is, is the aster's yellow that's showing up in the flax. When you go look at those plants, the upper half of the plants are a bright yellow color. The flower parts are a greenish yellow, and uh, and they're leaf-like. They don't really form the normal the normal flax purple flower. They're more of a, a yellowish type flower, and instead of being a flower type, they almost look like the the leaves. These ones don't form a bowl uh, as the you know the regular flax as it would develop a form of bowl to develop seed. And so you see these ones here where the, the bowl is being formed, but then you see these ones here where the, uh, the, the flower never did develop. And as we go to the next slide here, you can actually see that they're actually producing little bladder type uh, uh, fruiting bodies, which would be the Aster's yellow that's very similar to what we're seeing in canola as well. So I've been getting quite a few calls uh, regarding the uh, regarding the uh, flax with and asters yellow. So right now I would say the majority of our issue is asters yellow and flax. And, um, and the reason I'm going towards that is because we're seeing fairly high levels in canola. I've um, been getting calls from quite a few producers uh, regarding asters yellow um, in their canola and the levels. And uh, I guess the first thing I'd like to comment on on it is uh, because it looks so bad when you when you go out into the field, uh, it's probably a lot more noticeable, and it is a lot more noticeable when you go out into the field. So right away, that's the first one to get your attention. So all of a sudden, you're saying, you know, there's a there's a lot of a lot of a problem there. Um, I would say to just do some square meter counts and try to determine what your percentage is. A lot of guys I'm getting calls, and they're telling me 30 to 50 percent of the field, and and uh, to me, that's uh, that's way too high than it probably is. You know, the fields I've been in, I've been getting anywhere from five. Uh, I think the highest one I got was ten. Uh, there was a field here that I was by or by yesterday. That once we get talking a little bit more about uh, some of the canola issues, I'll show a picture of that field, and it was actually probably one of the highest ones I've seen. But just a a, a few pictures of the asters yellow and canola. And once again, you can see where, in this case, it affected the whole plant. In some cases, it might only affect part of the plant. So I've seen this, this plant here, and basically every, uh, every part of the plant was affected. So uh, I threw that picture in. But uh, you can also see sometimes where you know it's only one branch of the plant that, uh, that is affected. As you can see, the other ones here are still producing pods. So just a little bit about the aster's yellow and how it happens. Uh, it's caused by leaf hoppers uh, that come up early, uh, come up in the states. And, and this year we were getting a lot of calls earlier on, and we talked about it earlier on in the webinars regarding uh, the leaf hoppers that were out in a lot of the cereal crops. So we they were up here early, and um, you know uh, depending on uh, on when they start, when they get up here is usually dependent on how much damage they can do if if they are coming carrying the virus. So the way they infect the plant is they uh, they actually are a sucking insect, so they actually secrete some juice, uh, saliva into the plant when they're uh, going to feed on a plant, and then they they uh, they suck it back in, and when they suck it back in, the virus stays behind, and that's how they, uh, they infect the plant. Rarely we see infections higher than 5%, but like I mentioned, we are seeing levels this year that are higher. Um, and um, I guess it's uh, it's um, it's just because they came up. Uh, they, I think it's because they came up earlier this year. The other thing too is um, I, and it's hard to say because we still got uh, there's still a lot of fields to look at. But um, I've seen them where they probably done more damage right now, in my opinion, in the earlier seeded crops than they have 
in some of the later seeded crops. But you know, I guess it depends a bit on your area. But for right now, from the area I've been traveling, it seems like the earlier seeded crop seems to be showing more more effects. And there's just another picture of the asters yellow. Next thing I wanted to talk about uh, is some of the uh, uh, questions. I've been getting a few calls regarding uh, aphids. Uh, producers are going out in the field looking at their wheat, uh, shelling out heads, looking to see uh, uh, you know, with how the crop's heading, um, you know, say getting the same questions regarding oats, uh, getting a lot of questions, you know, uh, there's a ton of aphids out there, what are they doing, you know, are they doing any damage? Um, aphids are, again, a sucking insect, so they're basically living on the juice of the plant. We have a lot of plants out there right now that are fairly healthy, and, and uh, there's a lot of material there, so they can, there's a lot of material for them to feed on. So, um, yeah, are they doing any damage? Um, if if they are, it's very very small amount, and uh, be, in my opinion, nothing to be concerned about. I have seen some of them, and some of the fields that producers are calling about in the heads and stuff, and they're just basically sucking on the blooms of the of the of the, of the head, so they're really not doing any damage to the uh, the head. If if you get enough numbers on the head, and you know we're talking hundreds on the head, then you might see an issue. But uh, even with uh, the numbers you see on the screen there, like the numbers are fairly high, uh, but uh, they're doing very little damage to the leaf. Later on, you might see a skimming of that leaf where it maybe turn a whitish color, where they've uh, been uh, you know removing the juice from the plant. So you may see damage, but the damage these ones would do would be would be very little. I guess the good thing about it is uh, when we're out in some of the fields, the guys are asking, well, what are these guys doing? Well, this is the, the ladybug larvae, so they're actually feeding on the uh, on the aphids, and uh, so they're actually one of our beneficial insects and, and ones that we, uh, we like to see out there. So uh, um, they uh, often come in a couple of different colors, so uh, there's, there's another one there, but uh, they like to, you know, hang around there wherever there's aphids and feed on them. And and right now, when you go into the fields, you'll be seeing lots of these out there. So uh, again, that's just a beneficial insect that's out there, and it's helping to uh, remove uh, a lot of the aphids that are there. I guess one of the important things I wanted to talk about today is uh, is uh, is we're starting to get uh, quite a few calls regarding uh, Bertha armyworm. And the next uh, five to ten slides are going to deal with Bertha armyworm. But uh, I threw this one in because uh, uh, this crop was probably two weeks earlier, planted two weeks earlier than most of the crops in the southwest here. And it's, it's gone out of bloom. And uh, you can definitely see where it's potted really heavy. And this is probably the stage or the timing where it would be best to be uh, to be looking for, for army worms because this is going to be the stage where they can probably do some damage. I probably should have had it a little later in the presentation, but when we were talking about asters yellow, and this was the field I wanted to show you with the asters yellow plants. And if you could see all the plants there that are sticking up above the crop, those are all asters yellow plants. And this is probably the heaviest infestation I've seen so far this year. So you can see there's quite a few plants in there, but um, that had been just finished being sprayed with Laura's band this past couple of days, so uh, we didn't go into the field to, to look at it. But uh, uh, it still it looks bad, but it, it, the, the percentage levels are, are still are still fairly low in that field. This is a picture of probably what uh, more of the staging wise is in a lot of the canola crops. In the, in the southwest here right now. So in my opinion, uh, it's a great time to go scouting these fields uh, because you can kind of determine which fields might be your, your issue fields or your fields that you need to keep a closer eye on. Uh, but uh, at this point, you still have the time. When you walk out into a field like this, there's still a, a lot of leaf material in the lower part of the canopy. And uh, the army worms are small, and they'll be usually feeding on the lower parts of the plants and or the lower parts of the leaf. 
It's usually when the army worms get bigger is when they start causing issues and moving up the plants and starting to feed on the pods. So um, I guess right now um, uh, this is a great stage for checking and uh, you know just uh, to be monitoring uh, for them. We have had a few fields that have been sprayed and I think that's what's causing some of the alarm. We had had some uh, high trap counts in, in the southwest here and uh, so there's good reason for producers to be concerned. But again, uh, we just uh, right now we're in a stage where we need to be monitoring. One of the things we're finding out there right now, and I got these pictures from uh, one of the, uh, the crop scouts uh, in, uh, in one of the areas where the, uh, the problems are a little bit higher, and uh, what we're seeing is we're seeing um, a wide range in size of, of the armyworms. And uh, you can see these ones, uh, they're green. Uh, they got the yellow stripe on them, you know, green, yellow stripe. But you can see the difference in size from that one to some of these really small ones. And uh, I guess that's why uh, um, monitoring at this stage is right. And probably looking to spray at this stage is, is, is the best because if you were to go out and spray early, uh, you might not get a lot of these guys, especially if they're, um, you know, some of them might be just hatching out. Some of them will be smaller than this, and you might not get these ones. So you do run the risk of, uh, if the numbers are high enough, of uh, the potential of having to spray twice. And we did see that probably 10 or 12 years ago, we had an outbreak of Army Army armyworms in the southwest here and a lot of the canola fields were being sprayed and uh, uh, when it when the, kind of the panic hit what happened is guys were just spraying and a lot of them sprayed too early and then landed up having to spray again. So uh, that's just one thing I wanted to mention first of all that uh, numbers are high. This is what they're looking like right now and uh, we have quite, quite a few different stages of, of them. There are, there is a few of the more mature ones, and as they mature, they get a, like a brownish type color. Uh, and um, a key factor when you're looking for scouting for them is when you touch them, they curl up. Eh? So you know, there's one that you know he curls up, and but this is one of the more mature ones. Here's another more mature one here. And again, just a couple more pictures of the differences in stages we've been seeing in, in this in the same field. So, you know, if you had several that were in this stage, you definitely would be looking at spring because the the uh, these are the ones that usually work their ways up higher on the plants and are feeding higher up. You very seldom see these ones high up on a plant. So scouting for these guys, what uh, what is the best way of doing it or or you know when's the best time to do it? Um, Really, you can scout for armyworms pretty much any time of the day. It's just uh, sometimes the day, uh, sometimes periods of the day are easier for to find them than others. Um, they don't like a lot of heat, so they'll be on uh, the hot part of the day. They'll be down in the lower parts of the canopy. They'll be underneath leaves. That one field that I mentioned earlier on that had been sprayed already they were finding them under mushrooms in the field. Uh, they were, uh, well, see, right now in some of the fields that are moist, you see mushrooms growing in there and they were actually finding them underneath the mushrooms. So you need to look in several areas under the, the canopy, like when you're looking for them in the heat of the day, be flipping over these leaves, they'll be underneath the leaves, you have to unfold them because they'll get themselves curled up and if the leaf is curled, they'll get right inside there and stay wherever it's cold. Um, I have seen them as far as that goes uh, go into the cracks of, of the ground even uh, if there's cracks in the ground. So uh, if you're checking during the day or during the heat of the day, you, that's where um, the majority of the bin, some of them might still be on the plants. Uh, best thing to do when you're looking at the plants is to grab a square meter of plants and shake them like crazy so everything falls to the ground. And then, uh, and then start counting and uh, and looking at everything on the ground and seeing what's there. I have, uh, and I didn't include pictures of the diamondback moth, but I have been getting some calls regarding diamondback moth as well. So while you're out there, you might as well be scouting for both of them. 
Uh, the Army work we know is uh, is looking looking like this type shape, either the more mature ones or the smaller ones. The uh, Diamondback moth, if uh, you shake the plants and they fall off, a lot of times they'll they'll drop a little um, string that holds them onto the plant, and you can see them hanging from the plant. Uh, otherwise, they're usually a small green worm. I didn't include a picture of them today, but they're a small green worm, our larvae, and uh, they'll be feeding usually on the leaves or the undersides of leaves is where uh, I usually find them. You can find them on the pods later on. Uh, a lot of times um, the easy way to find them or know that they're there is if you see cocoons, and the cocoons will be on the undersides of leaves or in, on pods. There's um, several products that um, are available to use to control uh, armyworm and diamondback. So, uh, you know, I guess uh, depending on what your counts are, the levels and uh, the severity, you can uh, decide on which product you want to use. So I guess with that, I'm going to I'm going to leave the canola one. I think that's the biggest issue we are going to be dealing with within the next uh, week or so we, uh, in the southwest here as a lot of the canola gets into uh, the stage where, uh, you know, where we'll be seeing where the, some of the, the army worms can be doing more damage. So I guess it's time to start scouting a lot of the fields. Uh, if you're dealing with producers or if you've got your own canola field, you should be definitely be monitoring them over the next couple of weeks here. While I was out, I uh, was uh, looking at some sunflower fields as well. Sunflowers have really uh, come on lately because of the uh, of, uh, the great growing conditions we've had. They love the heat and they've been, they've been going like crazy. Uh, I uh, haven't seen a whole bunch of uh, issues with the sunflower beetle in the fields I've been in. I haven't seen a whole lot of issues with with uh, with many of the insects, truthfully. I've uh, just managed to seen a couple. I've seen a lagus bug on one here, but you know it was uh, an opportunity to take a picture of one, but uh, really no, no major issues. The uh, sunflower crops that I've been in are looking, uh, looking really well, actually. Um, I uh, did see the sunflower moth uh, as well, but again, uh, numbers and levels I've seen are, are fairly low. And uh, but again, there's not a lot of sunflower fields to in the area this year. And so to uh, to say just because um, I haven't seen a, a lot doesn't mean they're not here because uh, I haven't been in a lot of fields. We've got a lot of uh, soybean crops out there right now that are, uh, uh, are have actually enjoyed the warm weather and have come on really well. And, and then the last couple of rains we got have even made them better. So the crops are, are looking really good. Um, again, uh, when I was in this one, uh, you know, the uh, potting started uh, uh, fairly early on, so it is fairly close to the ground, but uh, you know they're potting really well. Um, no real disease issues to speak of as of yet. No real uh, issues for uh, for plant development, and uh, they're definitely thickening up right now. And uh, this last rainfall we got on the weekend, and if we get some heat here, we'll definitely see them fill in and and uh, and develop. When I was out in a flax field the other day there, there was uh, uh, lots of different, I guess, uh, worms out there right now. And I, John, you, John Zablowski even had this in the insect update this week, and this is a zebra caterpillar. So I've seen him on a, on a flax field. Uh, I guess right now when everybody's uh, concerned about the army worm, they're looking for worms or bugs and everything, and I think that's going to be a lot of our calls over the next little while here. Um, there are are lots of uh, different types of uh, worms out there, and some of them are beneficial, but, you know, I guess this, we're going to be uh, seeing a lot over the next week or so. Just, uh, I guess, a word uh, when I got the flax picture up here. Um, 
armyworms can be in flax as well, and we have seen them uh, affect flax crops before as well. So if you're out in your flax field, it would, should be a good idea to be monitoring the flax as well. So if you're in an area that's got a high level of armyworms or there's a lot of spraying going on, it's probably, and you've got some flax crops in that area, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to be monitoring those fields as well. I guess with that, um, I'm going to um, uh, leave the crop update unless there's some questions. Uh, Tom, has any questions? No, I don't have any questions for you at this time. Okay, good. Well, I mentioned earlier on in the, the start of the webinar that we were going to uh, talk a little bit about desiccation, and I wanted uh, to... Lionel, uh, I did yeah? just get a question. Is this mm -hmm. Bertha armyworm or just armyworm? So uh, it it's be... the Bertha armyworm. Okay. Yeah. Um, if somebody is uh, thinking, they might be thinking there's because there's been this serial serial armyworm around this year, and uh, but this one with the um, with the it's fairly notable when you look at the the green with the yellow stripes on the side. Um, it's these pictures didn't come out clear because I got them off uh, off a uh, an iPhone and then it was emailed to me. So they uh, through the whole process didn't come through very well. But uh, you can definitely see on this one the green and the, uh, the yellow stripe on the side, and uh, that's uh, that would be the uh, Bertha armyworm. If you're in some cereal crops and you're seeing some uh, Worms feeding on the, on the crop as well. There is the cereal armyworm that uh, that has been around and we're getting reports. I haven't seen uh, too much of it this year, um, but uh, some areas have reported some issues with it. Okay, back to desiccating uh, of the uh, of our winter cereals, and uh, I guess uh, you know uh, really. Uh, some areas have probably started already in the province. Probably the eastern side of the province has been desiccated. Uh, some of it, uh, I heard uh, yesterday, or yeah, yesterday that they were harvesting some of the early crop, uh, the early winter wheat crops already. So they would have been desiccated a while ago. I guess uh, with the uh, with the winter wheat crops in this area, this is the stage that the majority of them are in. And you can see that there still is a fair bit of, of green in, in a lot of the heads. And uh, I guess there's uh, two reasons to look at, uh, at desiccation. And I've always kind of believed that there was either one way is to speed up harvest or the other one is for weed control. Now, you'll get both, but uh, if you're going after weed control issues, uh, it would be, uh, you know, especially if you've got, say, Canada thistle as an issue in your field, what I would do is uh, go out and scout the field and and look at the staging because uh, you know you do get better kills if the, the thistle is in better state in, in the right stage for uh, for the application and and that that time period is when uh, the thistles are in the bud stage or just starting to flower so you know uh, if uh, if you're out in the field and you're looking at the, at your winter wheat and you know, you figure it's borderline being ready to spray, but the thistles could use a couple more days. Then you do probably better off waiting, and then this way you'll get better uh, better weed control. If you're just doing it to speed up harvest, uh, then you know uh, applying it, uh, you know, um, a little bit early isn't going to be as big a factor as 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 the weed control. I've been getting some calls regarding, um, you know, the application of uh, of pre-harvest and uh, and then maybe later on looking at keeping some of the seed for uh, for for seed. And uh, I guess the big caution there has always been that uh, glyphosate can uh, affect the germination of uh, of the seed. And uh, when you spray a uh, pre-harvest on, the recommendation is not to keep the seed for for seed because you can. Uh, you can, you know, um, harm the, the germ for the following year. If you're set on doing it, uh, you know, the best thing to do would be to let that crop get as ripe as you can. 
and then then go out and apply it. So you know, basically looking at the weed control part of uh, your desiccation instead of uh, instead of you know bringing the crop in. And uh, the reason I say that is we seem to from from the people that have been doing it, uh, we seem to be getting better results on the term test when they wait as long as they can before they go out and desiccate, and uh, to the point where you know a lot of the kernels are hard already, and this way it just seems that uh, a lot of the kernels don't pick up the, the product. Now, one thing you got to remember is there is a pre-harvest interval for a lot of the the, uh, the products, so if you're using uh, whatever product you're you're looking at using. Um, you're you're looking at a pre-harvest date, and so you need to be watching to make sure you've got that time period uh, before you're going to go in and harvest the crop as well. So um, I think 30 days is probably the minimum, but I'd have to check that. But you know, depending on the product you're you're using, you definitely need to be watching that as well. Now, what should the wheat look like uh, when you go out there and shell out those heads? Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll be looking at uh, wheat that looks very similar to this, and uh, this is what some of the wheat looks like right now. And uh, kernels like uh, this kernel here, uh, if you were to grab it and squeeze it, you're still going to uh, get uh, kind of some juice kind of coming out of it as well as it's it's going to be kind of more of a doughy type kernel. You know, any of these ones that are still fairly puffy are going to do that. And, and um, I'm sure everybody knows or heard about the, the old fingernail test. If you go with your fingernail and 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 squeeze on the kernel, if you uh, leave a dent in the kernel, then uh, then they say it's usually the, you know that time time that time period is is good for desiccating. If uh, you break the kernel or you mush the kernel. Then you know you're you're in too early, and uh, you do run the risk of killing the plant too fast, and those kernels not developing uh, to their full potential. So um, the next question comes out as well: What part of the field do you look at? Because you'll get uh, main stems that are ripe and hard, and and tillers that are are um, are soft and still in the dough stage. Well, with uh, with winter wheat, it's a little bit easier of a decision because you uh, uh, we're looking at you know desiccating in July here and still having a lot of you know nice harvesting days ahead of us hopefully uh, so uh, you can wait and and try to get those tillers on as far as you can and and that'll always just increase your your yield because you're not going to risk the fact of losing those ones however uh, uh, you know, if you want to get it off and uh, and get the crop done, um, you know, uh, basically if uh, you, you go in and spray too early, you might lose some of those early tillers. And again, you do need to remember the uh, the pre-harvest interval too. So if uh, you know after spraying, you still have so many days to wait before you can go in and, and harvest that field. And. I mentioned those days, and 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 a lot of people always say, well, you know, that's too many days. But when you really think about it, by the time you get the crop to dry down and the weeds to dry down and uh, everything, uh, that harvest interval is is not not too far off as to being what you need for getting in there and actually taking off the dry crop. Uh, Lionel, I do have a question for you. Is there okay. any advantage in enhancing dry down by adding the product aim? Uh, what was the product again? AIM. Okay. Um, by adding, uh, and I'm sure uh, what those would be, be like pH adjusters and uh, and um, and uh, or just other products that help with uh, uh, more of a sticker than they are of a of a. Of of a, uh, enhancing the product, I guess anything you can get on the crop that's going to help the chemical get into the plant easier, then it's going to uh, help in the the the, the breakdown or the, or, or the the death of the plant, and which will in, uh, increase our our uh, make your harvest that much more quicker. 
Now, um, a lot of the products that uh, guys are looking at using are uh, pH adjusters or another type sticking type agent, and those those products do work well. Uh, they do work a lot better in the spring than they do in the fall uh, because uh, in the spring you don't have as much material as you're going out there to spray. Now, um, with uh, with a lot of the winter wheat out there right now, we're we're looking at a lot of lodging issues in a lot of areas. We're looking at a fairly thick crop. So uh, I would say that uh, water volume would be my first thing. Uh, 10 gallon would be better than 5 just because you want to get better coverage. And, uh, and then, you know, and then uh, uh, adding a different, uh, you know, uh, something else to the, to the tank to increase its uh, um, its ability to get into the plant would definitely help, but uh, to me, the water volume is probably the, the first thing I'd be looking at. Okay, uh, is there any other questions, Karma? No, I don't have any other questions right now. Okay, well, I did mention that this was going to be a little bit shorter of a uh, presentation this this week uh, and um, so uh, again just uh, there's the uh, the information uh, regarding the uh, uh, contacts one thing I wanted to mention I didn't get a chance to prepare a slide was uh, that this Friday is the uh, the Waito tour in Melita and they're going to be going through several plots uh, you know everything from uh, different varieties. There's the canola varieties, there's the wheat variety trials, uh, there's different methods of seeding, there's uh, just a whole bunch of different uh, lots and a lot of really interesting work that Scott and uh, Scott Day and Scott Chalmers are doing out there and uh, there's also going to be uh, an opening of the new um, uh, windmill electric uh, power, power station that's been developed there as well. So uh, if uh, producers or or if you know of people that are might be interested in going, it's uh, it's this Friday. It's going to be at Maletta. Uh, it's at the John Deere dealership is where uh, everybody meets. Uh, I think lunch is at 12 o'clock, and I think the tour starts at 1. So um, if you're interested in going, uh, uh, get down there. Definitely going to be an interesting day, and uh, the way they're talking weather-wise, I think we'll have a, a nice day for weather, too. So uh, plan to attend that tour this Friday. And again, here's the FPAs uh, in the uh, in the southwest. With that, I guess we'll end the webinar for today. And if and unless there's any other questions, Carmen. No, I don't have any other questions. Okay. Thanks for everybody attending.